Do you know what I miss is laser. Really? Like, I feel like paintball with projectiles and stuff, it's, it's like, yeah, accurate. Yeah, but laser, I don't know, there, I was younger when it was laser tag. Uh-huh. And I don't know what laser tag is like now. I bet it's fucking but, awesome. But, like, laser tag then was like, I, I mean, I even remember my call sign. My call sign was evil. <laughs> what we That's what I'm going to call you now. Well, I do hear the music. You do? Yeah. Got it. Well, now I hear it. Yeah. Okay. Probably missed it because of the flutter echo. Yeah, there's this flutter echo right over here that I'm sure you all can't hear. Um, that's why we use these very particular mics. Um, welcome to the Video Reformation Podcast. I'm Ben Oliver. I'm Justin Plant. We're the co-founders of Storyboard Media and your guides to practicing effective video for business. We're like the Juan Sanchez Villa Lobos Ramirez to your Connor McLeod and Highlander. Was that a character name? Yes, that was Sean Connery. Oh, really? Yeah. He did not... He's Scottish, isn't he? He is, but he was playing a... Um, well, He, I think he's Welsh, actually. But he was... Uh, yeah, he was playing a Spaniard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's Villa Lobos. Yeah, sure. Whatever. Um, yeah, either way. He was his mentor. Mm. And... Uh, I was not allowed to watch it. Mm. It's a good one. Because it's all about chopping off heads. It is, yes, because there can't be only one. Yes. Yeah. Although it's odd that it takes centuries for them to ultimately get to only one. Mario Van Peebles was in the uh, was in a sequel, I think. I just like saying his name. Mario Van Peebles. Mario Van Peebles. Oh, Peebles. Peebles. All right, before we jump into our topic today, which is, incidentally, uh, part three of our Types of Video series. We're talking about live-action, unscripted video today. A uh, little housekeeping as usual. We're going to tighten it up a little bit this time, but uh, send us your topic requests because we want to talk about what you want to hear about. Um, otherwise, we'll just make shit up, and apparently people will keep listening because we've uh, had quite a bump in, uh, yeah, in viewership you. over the last month or Very so. exciting. Uh, I checked last night, and it has continued into this month. Which so. has allowed us to really, like... Our rates have our gone sponsorship the roof. rates are whew, yeah yeah um, and and that's good because we do have a new sponsor this episode <clears throat> mm -hmm. they got under the old pricing they did they did but they've lucked out they got it under the old pricing mm -hmm. but now that we have this audience so sign up now yes because um, it's more expensive now so if sign you up anything now anything from this show um, sign up now yeah and you know if you're lucky you'll be as lucky as our new sponsor this week burrito water. Um, stick around and, and hear the full spot later on But uh, our new sponsor Burrito Water It's not smart um, Okay On to part three of our types of video series That's again as mentioned Live action unscripted video In part two we mm -hmm. talked about live action <clears throat> Scripted uh, content uh, We'll talk a little bit about you know, some, but not maybe all of these things, what it is, why to use it, when to use it, how to make it. Um, we'll Whatever probably we go on to. some tangents. We have an outline, but any of our regular viewers or listeners know the outline doesn't necessarily uh, tell us where to go with these conversations. Um, since it is very similar to our last episode in the series, Live Action Scripted, um, what, what, what do you recall were some of the takeaways from the live action scripted episode just to give people a little <clears throat> bit of context mm -hmm. um and if you could come up with something that isn't what i've written okay, here <laughs> as mine i put a two there that's still blank that was uh, for you well to, there are a couple twos and ones to, to, there's, there's a one and a two off. um i'll tell you what i'll take the first start, one and then i'll make something up while you're talking yes um and I only know this because I listened to the end of the episode to confirm what we said we would talk about in this episode. Mm -hmm. But there was this lovely little part at the end of the episode where um, in talking about editing live action scripted versus unscripted, it's like putting together a 500 piece puzzle mm -hmm. where with scripted, you have the image on the box and you know mm -hmm. what you're trying to make live action unscripted as I'm sure we'll get into today is you still have the 500 puzzle pieces, but you don't necessarily have the picture on the box mm -hmm. to go to something kind of related to that. Uh, that is, I'm now kind of ringing a bell here. Um, a lot of times people revert to live action, unscripted type content because they don't really have a good handle on their messaging right. yet. And by using something like live action, unscripted, 
they can get other people to articulate that for them, and then they then they have to go put the puzzle pieces together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I and I think part of what we're going to talk about later on is to use unscripted content when you do know your messaging, and to help guide. There's a place if for it's both. Interview. Yes, Whether absolutely. Whether or not you know your messaging, there is a place for both. Yeah. Okay. So, um, any other takeaways we wanted to address from the previous episode, or I don't know, maybe some of our Instagram live? Yeah. We got any Instagram live uh, view? Nope. We got no Instagram live viewers. Um, move on to number. Okay. So, what is live action unscripted video? I believe I have it defined here as a live action. Mm-hmm. So you're using a camera and yep. shooting people. People. Animals. Filming. People, yeah. Something yeah. Like that. Um, B is that it's not scripted. Yeah. Does that mean it's not planned? Absolutely not. It can it can mean that, but because yeah. that can be the case. Sure. So it can be planned or unplanned, but it is not written. Here's what you're going to say. What are some of the common types of live action unscripted to give to give the people a sense of of what kinds of videos we're talking Most about? Most commonly, you'll see. It, it comes in a documentary style format. The testimony, give me a testimonial about what, using the product, mm-hmm. or uh, a case study, or event recaps, stuff like that. I'm missing. I'm sure there are there are all different ways to kind of formulate those things. I do think doc style is the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, what a lot of people think unscripted mm-hmm. um, I think we've discussed how l- animated unscripted might be really really uh, hard, really hard. expensive <laughs> really expensive but live action unscripted to me um, until preparing for this it really was just documentary style but I think you're right that that kind of event video like a recap video that is not a whether you're getting attendees point of view or not uh, even if it's just all b-roll with music um, that is not a scripted piece of video content I think oftentimes company culture videos are unscripted there are certainly ways to do scripted company culture videos but I think a lot of them tend to rely on employee interviews management people are giving authentic reactions because yes. i mean that's it's like you... their testimonial of working there as opposed to their testimonial of using a product yeah. or a service i was thinking um just because we were in an email chain recently um that thing we did for duke uh, a couple summers ago mm-hmm. that program yep that was a documentary but it had a different style to it well and there are a lot of documentary styles too yeah this i think is live action yeah. unscripted. Whoa. Whoa, hold on. That, <laughs> that, that changed the direction of the whole episode here. What we're going to do is fumble through the rest of the episode, and you're just going to see an example of live action unscripted video. <laughs> and then video. you're going to go back and put all the pieces together Yes. when we're done. Yeah, and that, that of course that means if you're listening to the audio version, you now have to find the video version. Because we're not talking about live action unscripted audio uh, yeah. today. Mm-hmm. That's a different episode. Um, yeah, I, and I guess any event video is really unscripted. I, uh, so, okay, to clarify, when we talk about event video, we kind of have three. We have promoting the event, enhancing the event, and like capturing the, the event. event. Yeah. Yes. And so, um, but anything that's like leveraging the event is largely going to be unscripted because you're just taking advantage of a presentation that's being given, a keynote yeah, so or breakout the, the, session, and that's that another, kind of thing too. Like what we did for um, our local client here um, when their CEO went up on stage. Yes, that was it. Was he had an outline? He but he went up and spoke from the heart, and we were able to put that into a really nice. And, and that one, I would piece. say we were just because we sat in the room as he refined his speech. Mm-hmm we were almost more involved in the scripting, but if you're covering an event for a client and the presentation itself may be scripted, but if you just got two or three cameras in the room, that's not a scripted video. Mm-hmm. Like as the producer, if you if you don't have the script, if you haven't seen the script, mm-hmm. just because something may be a rehearsed performance, like a presentation yeah. like that, 
I wouldn't call that scripted video content. I would mm -hmm. still put that under unscripted content. Yeah. And that one you may have less flexibility in the editing because you need to really follow the presentation. Yeah. But there are still a lot of a lot of editing that needs to be done to live presentations to take out ums, ahs, pauses. And just to make it interesting. from Because there's one thing when you're there live. You're engaged with a bunch of other people. There's an energy in the room. But when you're watching it on your computer screen, any little pop-up or bullshit notification could take your attention away. It's just nice to be able to package that in a more exhilarating or engaging way. B-roll even, you know, mm -hmm. cutting to the slides, cutting to the front door shot of their office or whatever it is. Cutting to the audience reaction from later yeah. in the presentation for the one time they actually left, but using like different angles of that shot five mm -hmm. times throughout because mm -hmm. they only left the one time. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that's there's probably even more that 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 will come up with that as we discuss. But to me, I, I still just I, I still think about that documentary style. Um, even like a news style, right? Where, where it's that there's that interviewer, there's somebody mm -hmm. giving, you know, somebody's asking questions, right? And it's, it's local news at 60 minutes. It's, it's feature length documentaries. All of those have that kind of common thread of interview of, of like, of, of like capturing the research process almost. Right, like those interviews. Yeah. I mean, it comes off that way, right? Yeah. Like this is the first time you're having this conversation, yeah. and we're capturing these moments, and and we'll get to in a few minutes how, how the good documentary stuff isn't that at all. There's mm -hmm. a lot of prep that goes into it, but they kind of have this feel of like this kind of off the cup. I'm just going to be authentic in the moment and just say what comes to mind. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you, as the producer of that video as the director of that video as the interviewer you have so much control even if something isn't scripted even if you don't know the exact words that are going to come out of your subject's mouth you know where you want the thing to go and so you can guide the conversation but you don't know exactly what they're going to say they may surprise you those kinds of things i wrote down cinema verite <clears throat> have you ever seen a business use that format i don't think so i think i don't know that i know a hundred percent i don't think i've ever seen i don't think i've seen one it doesn't pure, mean it hasn't happened yeah no i'm saying um i don't think i've seen a pure cinema verite film it's um my limited exposure to it is it's very French. depressing um <laughs> but same thing yeah um i feel like event videos can be that way like a recap. It can be, but I feel like there's an element, and and to any of our our listeners who know more about this, please let me know where I'm wrong here. But I feel like, I mean, don't actually. That would hurt my feelings. Um, <laughs> but but I feel like Zinema Verite. It almost requires a like raw, like exposing of kind of hidden problems. Almost it like Cinema Verite to me is not supposed to be uplifting. It's supposed to be real and rough and raw and yeah, raw. unapologetic and just a sometimes like grotesque. you're sitting in the room mm -hmm. and oftentimes that is awkward or boring or or whatever, but it creates a tension that even the people it gives you to me it gives us just enough of a sense of omniscience that because. You may know individuals' motivations when you're in there. When they're together, it just creates a tension um, that just feels kind of raw and scary. And um, I don't know. It almost makes you as a viewer feel vulnerable and exposed just as much as the characters are. And I attach all of that to Cinema Verite. I don't necessarily know why. It may just yeah. have been a really weird one Cinema Verite thing that I watched several years ago. I look forward to the opportunity to make something like that. I don't know where that opportunity exists. I feel like the way we would do it would be to study some popular cinema verite pieces and then do a spoof, spoof yeah. of cinema verite, yeah. um, which I think could be it could be funny. Could be really funny. Um, okay, yeah. where should we go next? Well, that's kind of our our 
roundabout definition of what live action unscripted is. Why would you do live action unscripted versus scripted content or uh, mm-hmm. animated? Um, Off the top of my head, I want to say the, the word authenticity, but I don't think that's quite the right word. It, it, it's certainly a part of it, but it doesn't mean that live action scripted or animation can't be authentic. Mm-hmm. But there's a certain truth when you're not telling someone what to say. Yeah, there's there's a certain truth when someone is just using their own words. Mm-hmm. So I maybe it'll pop into my head, but it's somewhere around the word truth, authenticity, honesty. Um, there's kind of an unfiltered. I I trust the people that I'm listening to more if it's unscripted because they didn't take the time to craft their yeah. message. Yeah, and I think that has benefits too. I feel, you know, I I almost feel like this series is setting itself up as kind of like a debate series, right? Where like in in the previous episode, it was the reasons to use live action mm-hmm. scripted, and now we're on the reasons to use live action unscripted. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive, um, but you know, you we talked mix, about you can mix those styles. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but it, you know, simply I, by adding a narrator, you can can yes. mix. Yeah, stuff together, and, and so I feel like we, you know, I, I feel like we, we've already fought for scripted at the expense of unscripted, but now I, but now I see fighting for unscripted at the expense of scripted, um, and and that is that is what it comes down to. It's 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 hearing whether it's someone inside the company or outside the company, uh, inside the brand, outside the brand. It's them giving their personal understanding and impact and experience and and whatever that has the opportunity to appeal to a lot more people than a well-crafted message Mm -hmm. a a well-crafted polished message um that's immediately the 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 frame of mind that i go into when i see especially any kind of interview style right that kind of like looking at an interview or off camera there there's even some really interesting documentary stuff that's done to camera right but but you also get the sense that they're talking to the interviewer and you are the interviewer as opposed to you know the interviewer is just sitting right there off camera um but anytime i see that kind of framing it puts me in in a mindset of okay i'm interested in what this person has to say Mm -hmm. and and what their experience was what Mm -hmm. their takeaways were what their feelings were those kinds of things it it is different with the looking off camera, there's a little bit of like a, a voyeur aspect to, to as the viewer, <laughs> this is where it comes from. Yeah. But like you're you're, almost just riding a shotgun, uh, throughout this journey. Uh-huh. Whereas when you're speaking, when when you're watching something where someone's speaking to camera, you feel like you're involved in the story a little bit more. I think there's a little different dynamic, and I think that that can help you decide which way to to go. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. Um, I think, right, so all of this goes through the filter of, of the strategy for, for these pieces, right? So, so specifically, what's the audience I'm talking to? And so if, if you're using, if you're interviewing someone who is going to share, um, is going to make a recommendation to someone who's essentially similar to them. So if you want to create, if you want to use your customers and your users to create a like call to action, call to arms kind of video where you want those users to speak directly to your potential mm-hmm. customers and say, you need to use this. If you right? want to involve that viewer. If you want to involve that, I would do that directly to camera. Be- with the- because then, because then, I mean, the, the camera is is the eyes of the viewer, right? Mm-hmm. So if I'm the subject and I'm making eye contact with you, and my messaging is about what you should do, this is going to be much more effective than <clears> this. <throat> if I'm saying you need to do this, I'm talking to that person over there. If I'm talking, however, about my experiences, I found that this product mm-hmm. helped me save money, save time, whatever then it's less important 
that I say that into the eyes of the person. I can get away more with talking to the interviewer and say, I had a great experience with this company. It doesn't it doesn't take away the way that talking to you without looking at mm-hmm. it takes away. With the Duke thing, we wanted our viewers to sign up or apply for the program. Mm-hmm. We didn't want them just to see what the program was about. We wanted them to sign up. So we asked our, our subjects to speak directly to those people, and it made it more engaging for that viewer. Mm-hmm. And so when you do that, when you when you target those viewers the right way, you when you when you put your you know, your money into paid ads or whatever and get it in front of those right people, it's very valuable because it helps them it helps them decide whether or not to take the next step. You're right; it's all kind of seen through that uh, strategic veil or whatever that what are you trying to do who are you talking to and what do you want them to do and how yeah and how are you if, gonna... if you literally want them to feel more confident you don't have to make a personal plea to mm-hmm. them if you want them to take a specific action then you may want to speak to them directly mm-hmm. um and those can be and, and and to me that's just you know that's kind of like leveling up i think everybody is used to because it's so ubiquitous you know, local news, all that kind of stuff, like early video creators, that's just kind of their point of reference, right? I mean, so much when, when, when we were just individual videographers, so much of what we did was interview Mm -hmm. stuff, doc style Mm -hmm. stuff. It's just, it's just what you do because there are people to talk to. Mm -hmm. And like we talked about, you don't, you know, we, we've often talked about it being used as a crutch for people who don't have a defined message. Yeah. But it's, it also is, I think, at the same time, we often talk about how it's a great way to understand how you're perceived and what your messaging yeah. should be is to go through that process yeah. of interviewing your clients. Think about our testimonials page, right? For anybody who hasn't been to our site and looked at our testimonials page, we literally, like four and a half years into business, had never asked any of our clients for a testimonial. We sent one email that said, take 30 seconds and send me what it's been like working with us, right? And we got 40 responses, something. I I mean, a lot. And they, they they're all on our testimonials page. Um, but I've forgotten where I was going with that, but I thought, you know, (laughs) that's just a good little pat on the back that we did it, but it's, (laughs) it's easy. Um, I think my point was it's easy just to ask, and then you can take those testimonials and say, okay, would you be interested in talking more on camera? And you get to kind of interview that person as a customer to understand more about your customers and prospects, but also capture that to understand how people are actually using what it is you do. Mm -hmm. Um, How does it affect them? You may think that, and you may know, that the top three benefits of your product are, are X, Y, and Z. But in interviewing two or three people, you may find out that, in fact, the biggest benefit to the actual end users is, you know, W. Mm-hmm. And and mm-hmm. that's something that you hadn't really thought about putting out there, but now you're actually hearing it from your real customers. Yeah. And and so it's a way to learn how to speak to your prospects and your customers um, while at the same time creating content and, and sharing that kind of stuff. Um, I think... Well, good save, Ben. Good save. <laughs> uh, I think it's a very common form of video because... It, and I don't want to offend some of our friends who do this type of video for a living. Well, we can. I, I wouldn't mind offending some of them. <laughs> but it, it 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 can be the easiest type of video to make. Sure. And so I think that's also why you see it out there a lot. I, and and I think what you're saying is we have a lot of friends who do it really well. Yes. And it's not. And that is that not easy. That can be very yes. difficult to to craft. Essentially, what you need to do for a video like this is you need a camera, a microphone, and a subject. And then you could just stand there as the director, producer, videographer, or whatever, and just say, "All right, tell me about your experience," and not, and then just hit record and hit stop, pack up, and go home. Yeah, that's that's literally is about the easiest form of video you could. I've done it hope before. to make. Yeah. However, it usually doesn't make it that good. Right. Um, the, the really good stuff and the really moving and powerful types of unscripted live action comes from a lot of work. 
And we're going to get to that later. It's also, I think, really valuable content for newer video producers to make because of exactly what you just said. It's easy to do, so do it a bunch. Yeah, hone your craft. Get better at, at lighting, at focus, at, at composition, at editing, at audio editing, at interviewing. Yeah. Do as many of these things as you can because you can go as a one person band mm -hmm. and and set all this stuff up. And it's relatively easy to reach out to any company that wants to do video and say, look, find me your three best customers and I will go interview them. Mm -hmm. Use those to just get better at all of those things. And uh, um, yeah, it's it's both good and bad that it is so easy to do. Mm hmm. What about what are some other advantages of doing this type of video? Um, I don't know. One one note you have here: emotional over rational. Oh, is that where we are? I think so. Well, then we're at the second uh, two. Uh, okay, we're at we're at two two. Two B two. Two B I I. Okay, well, if we're there, I don't want to skip over providing social proof. Okay. Because I think that that that's a big thing. Um, we've talked in many episodes about the law of diffusion of innovation, we've talked about social proof. The, as you go from, you know, an early adopter to the early majority to the late majority, I mean, your innovators to early, uh, early adopters to early majority to late majority to laggards, the, the further down that chain you go, the more social proof, the less risk people are willing to take. Mm -hmm. And the more social proof they need that something works because they aren't willing to take that risk. What's really convenient about looking at it the reverse is the earlier in those stages you are. As a customer or oh, as a as if, like you, a, if you look at those people as a as a. An innovator mm -hmm. needs no proof. They're willing to take risks. They, they like to, to be mm -hmm. on the cutting edge. And they like receiving credit for being on. The, they're willing to fail, yeah, and that's fine because they've often got the resources to mitigate, you know, a failure. Right? They they're more willing to take on risk because they've got they've got more security. Yeah, because it actually isn't as risky as yes, it might seem. Yes, but those people, the 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 innovators, the early adopters, they like to be seen as innovators and early adopters. So they are they are begging. To be the person saying, I was one of the first people on this, and here's what it did to me. Mm -hmm. And when you pair that with the people later on in the process who need more and more people saying, this is what it did for me, yeah. the problem solves itself. Yeah. So if you're, if you're at the point where you're trying to, to go from early adopters to early majority. The chasm. The chasm. You've got your innovators and your early adopters who want to be featured as early users of this thing. Mm -hmm. I took the risk. I win. Yeah, you're right. It's not, it's not, the that, they, that, it's not just that they want to help out. No, 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 no. They want to be featured. Yes. No, I, I think it is is not at all about they want to help the brand. <laughs> and they might, want to be seen as, and, and, and it depends, right? Because oftentimes the innovators say, I got in early. I helped them build what it is, mm -hmm. right? Take because I like pride. this. I want to use it, but I, it also is what it is today because of mm -hmm. partially because of my involvement. I mean, if you think about like early Basecamp users and things like that, mm -hmm. they had a lot of influence over over where that product went. Mm -hmm. But they are motivated by being seen as risk takers and innovators and early adopters. So they are. It is so easy to get them to share their experiences. That is exactly the kind of of proof that you need to have a greater, a, a larger audience, mm -hmm. because you can then provide that to the people who need, need it. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that that to me is just one of the one of the the biggest pieces about the social proof mystery. stuff. Yeah, it's and 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 it's and social proof is not just testimonials. Social proof is is testimonials, but it's also case studies. And and because this is this episode, I think it's worth detailing the difference again. A testimonial is, is somebody's personal experience with something. Mm -hmm. uh, a case study is a more structured, like problem solution outcome. Data driven. It's usually. more data. It, it's usually more data driven, but it's 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 positioned as here's what I had. Mm -hmm. Here's what we adopted. Mm -hmm. Here's what changed. Mm -hmm. 
And I think you could use one person to do both of those because you've got the people yeah. who need the risk mitigation part of it where there just needs to be someone else who's tried it mm -hmm. and succeeded with it. Okay, well, then I don't have to take on all the risk because this is a proven product, yeah. service, whatever. But you could also use the same person to structure a case study for then the people where social proof isn't even just enough. They need to be able to justify from more of a business perspective. This is exactly what it's going to solve. This is what it's going to cost. This is what our ROI is going to be, whatever. And, and that can be the same people. Sometimes they need to make that emotional yeah. risk jump first, and then they need the, the like logical, analytical, numbers-based uh, risk. But you can get one person to provide both of those. You just want to create two different pieces of content, one on the emotional, one on the rational, mm -hmm. which I think does tie to the bullet point you were driving me to. Other, <laughs> other advantages of using or of this type of content um, I think this is kind of just piggybacking off of what you said, but it's it's a way for the viewers to connect with your brand through a human element. Because usually you're doing some sort of interview format yeah. for this live action unscripted. Therefore, you are using humans. You're not using prox like a bunny rabbit as mm -hmm. a proxy using an actual user. I now want to do a testimonial video with a bunny rabbit. Um, yeah, but it doesn't also it, it doesn't have to be customers either, right? You could put your executives, founders, um, employees into something too, and that still humanizes the yes, company. Yes, yes, yes. Yep. Yeah. No matter what yeah. the video is supposed to do, it also humanizes the brand. Yeah, I think that kind of touched on all of the uh, the advantages. Um, is it is it time for our our sponsor break? Mm hmm. Yep. Burrito water? Burrito water? Yeah. So, okay, let's let's hear from our new sponsor, Burrito Water. The people who brought you cucumber water, coconut water, and hot dog water are proud to bring you Burrito Water. You know that water that drips out from the bottom of the foil wrap burrito from your favorite local taqueria? We collect all those delicious drippings and add some electrolytes and ole, burrito water. When you're looking to hydrate but also crave something salty and a little savory, Likely with a hint of cilantro, burrito water is the flavored water for you. Available in carne asada, chicken mole, and coming soon, tofu. Best served slightly above room temperature with a side of chips and queso. Agua! Burrito water. Very nice. Glad to have them on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm constantly surprised that, that we can only end up with B2C sponsors, even though we specialize in video for B2B businesses. Mm -hmm. But... I'm okay with it. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, <clears throat> what is the B2B equivalent of burrito water, right? I mean, we just get exciting sponsors, uh, yeah. e even if they don't necessarily hit our target audience. Exactly. Well, I mean, our audience is also a human. That's true. And humans and, need and burrito water. From our research, they do eat burritos. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I love about burrito water is I can get that, that fix, mm -hmm. but, but not get... Chipotle, right? If you know what I mean. Oh yes. Yeah. Um, oh yes. So I, I even, I'll even put a little hot sauce and like lime. Of course. In there. Yeah. Um, tapatio, usually something more Mexican than not like a gochujang, like a Korean no, hot no, sauce no, no, or anything. No, no, but, no, no. but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's been really good for my workouts too. Like you said, the electrolytes. Mm -hmm. I haven't had any cramps in my legs or like my muscles. Right. My stomach cramps up a little bit. Yes. Uh, and I. My sweat is actually pretty salty. Yeah. More, more so than usual. Yeah. Tastes of refried beans. Yeah. <laughs> so, welcome to our new sponsor, Burrito Water. Shall we talk about how to make live unscripted video? Yeah, so making it. Making live action unscripted. I, and I, th I think a lot of this, too, is as we alluded to, there are people who, do, who we know and work with a lot who do this really well. Almost exclusively, this is their type of work. Yeah. Um, like we said, this can be the easiest video to possibly make. Let's talk about how to make it really good. But there's a spectrum here. Yeah. And, you know, based on your constraints and resources and whatever, um, you have to figure out what is best for your company. But the farther on that spectrum you get, yeah. the better off you're going to be. 
I, I think because it is so ubiquitous and so easy to do, people think that you don't have to put any prep into it and, and that the good ones just happen um, and it's magic. But that is not the case at all. The good ones have a ton of prep that goes into the uh, goes into them. So when we talk about practicing effective video, we've got seven steps. Mm-hmm. We're gonna we're gonna just focus on the production phase though, the okay. production yep. level. So going from pre-production to production to post-production, kind of bring you through the process here. I think the most important part of anything, any content that has to do with interviews, and so by extension, anything unscripted, is pre-interviewing your subjects. Mm-hmm. And it's it. There's several. Um, there's several benefits to them. Let's say, because we've done it several times. Let's say our client or our company has an event in Austin, and assume it's a live, you know, in-person event like they used to be. Mm-hmm. And we know that some of our partners, clients, prospects, users, uh, employees, all these people are going to be there. Great opportunity to get some some content and you know film those people it's gonna be 200 people there we can cram in 10 interviews in a day right Mm -hmm. we just show up set up and and grab people off the floor i wouldn't do it that way (laughs) because you'll probably get about three and they'll suck yeah so what do you do well um for us we'll uh, when we're working with a client where we've been hired to do this sort of project we will actually start with where where are these relationships with the clients where does that live? Is there an account manager? Are there salespeople who, who manage that part of the process? I mean, we've done the strategy stuff to figure out what what industries we need to focus on, mm. what they need to hear, what we're getting them to do, how we're you know, uh, promoting this stuff and all of that. But then um, once we have an idea of what we're, of the type of, types of videos we're trying to make, I guess types isn't perhaps appropriate because it's all live action unscripted, but when I say type, I mean, uh, like are we making one for the travel industry or making one for fashion or whatever? Um, we'll reach out to the people, the, the sales reps who, who have the connections in those industries because they're usually specialized in a vertical or right. something and ask them which, you know, which of your clients would be willing to do this. Um, and sometimes you really have to pull that out of them. Sometimes. And sometimes it should be willing. Sometimes it's who's got a great story. Mm-hmm. Who's yeah. got a great, and, and, and uh, coming off of our last episode I, I, or two episodes ago, I say story loosely. Who's got a good experience? Mm-hmm. You know, or or maybe who's done this before? Who's right. who? Who have you brought in to talk to a prospect before mm-hmm. about their experience? Something mm-hmm. like that. Uh, or you know, who's a leader in that in that industry? Mm-hmm. Um, any of those things are are great places to start. And so, we'll one way or another get an introduction to a potential subject. And if we know we've got eight or 10 interview slots on the day of production, you know, I'm thinking like 45 minute slots Mm -hmm. um, with 15 minutes for makeup and bullshitting and whatever. So if we've got 10 slots, we might, we might speak to 25 people Mm -hmm. and some people are going to be really nervous. Ideally. Ideally. Yeah. Some people are going to be really nervous and, and just doing it because they really like the salesperson and trying to do a favor. You can tell they're not going to be comfortable with it. Right. Um, you can find some people who are off the wall, like nut, like just kind of nutty and hard to contain, and they don't have coherent thoughts. Those are also difficult people to wrangle. Uh, I have <laughs> pictures of two faces in my head, but um, we'll save that for a. That's what we should do in the Instagram Live is oh, give out all of our sequ- all of our uh, secrets, and, mm-hmm. and we just edit that, that out of the podcast. But maybe that would get people to watch. <laughs> so we got 25 people identified yep and we'll and we have 10 slots yeah we're trying to fill those 10 ideally you, you fill them all sometimes you get half whatever but you don't just want to fill them with the first 10 people who agree to do it right you've got to conduct a pre-interview to to do a few things one to vet like you were just talking about the, the subject yeah is this someone who can speak coherent. Yeah. Right? Um, so that's going to knock out probably five to seven of your people. Yeah. And then you also need to understand what their experience was. What was their story? You have to do the entire interview you would want to capture live, like unfilmed. Like the, you, you have to do it 
in the moment without knowing anything uh, to understand what it is you want them to talk to you about when you have them for yes. that 45 yeah. minutes. So you may have to talk to them for an hour or an hour and a half, or maybe it's just 15 minutes. Or if this is a screen, yeah, if it's like a screening call just yeah. to see if they, they fit. But the value in the pre-interview to me is really in understanding and crafting your plan for the filmed interview. Mm -hmm. Because if you've got 10 interview slots to fill, you don't want to end up creating 10 videos that say exactly the same thing. You want to be able to know where you want to go with each individual subject, understand, have already talked to them about what their particular experience was, know where you want to guide them. Right? This is unscripted, but it's not like unstructured, unplanned, and unguided. Mm -hmm. You as the interviewer, and, and we talked about this in the in the interviews episode, your role is to get them to say what what you want them to say. Mm -hmm. You don't know what you want them to say if you don't do that pre-interview. Right. And so the pre-interview, then thirdly, it primes the subject to actually think about these things and have to verbalize them to you so that when before you they do show get, up. before they show up. So even if you're doing it like three weeks before, mm -hmm. at least they've taken these abstract thoughts and they've at least verbalized them to you. You've discussed them. You've asked them some follow-up questions. You may have listened to the recording that you made of that pre-interview. To, under, to help you develop the, the, the prompts. Mm -hmm. um, and then one of, the, one of the best things that I've seen is that you essentially create a, an interview Bible mm -hmm. for that shoot day that is based on those pre-interviews, where this person works, which product they use. The role they play. The role the they play, right. The, you know, you know. It's like a dossier. Just kind of a sense of like, oh, really liked talking about X, Y, Z. Yep. Um, you know, really As lit a, up and got animated when talking about this because that's part of it too is is because these people aren't professional actors, they're going to get onto the set and even if you've talked them through it before, mm -hmm. there's going to be some, and, and, and as we all know, it takes 30 to 40% more energy out here to get through those lenses and mm -hmm. onto the sensors. So you almost have to build in those kind of unrelated things to get them excited and talking about something that they're comfortable with and then follow up with the question that you want them to answer. So they're smiley, they're happy, they're comfortable, you know, yep. all those kinds of things. Um, and then you've got your list of, of kind of the topical pieces and, and how you want to guide that discussion. It, it, even things like it, it may seem to go off topic, but it can really help ask them what their hobbies are, what they do, yep. get to know them on a personal level because what you're looking for, in that piece is often you're trying to craft auth or create a platform for authenticity. And if they can yeah. feel comfortable talking about how they love to go dancing and you know the example I'm thinking of, then that's really interesting because then you might get to tie in a little of the lifestyle with the piece and make it more authentic. Mm -hmm. But you, you, it's just really hard to do that kind of thing on the spot. But that's what makes it compelling too, right? I mean, if we hadn't done that pre-interview, we wouldn't have heard that this guy did competitive Latin dancing mm -hmm. uh, with his wife. And, I could have guessed it and, when I saw him. <laughs> well, sure. But to hear him talk about that and actually admit that that he liked the the freedom to travel to mm -hmm. do that to you know I, I mean that that is an authentic, unique perspective that you can't script right. And so it would have been malpractice for us not to go that direction in the interview when we were actually capturing the interview, but, but you had to know it. Even if it had come up in the first 10 minutes of the interview, it's so hard to think on your feet to that level mm -hmm. to know. But, but in discussing it for, for three or four days, you can figure out how to craft the questions to then tie in and kind of, you know, create the theme of that interview around that flexibility, mm -hmm. that, that ability to have more of a lifestyle business because mm -hmm. he likes competitive, like that, that is that human trust, authenticity, honesty part mm -hmm. that we talked about at the beginning that because you can't write it and because it's so unique and individual, even if, even if your, your typical prospect isn't a competitive Latin dancer, they can replace their, hobby, family, whatever, with that. Their passion. And, and, and make mm -hmm. a connection with mm -hmm. that. Oh, 
this guy started using these people for these things, and now he's able to go with his wife and, mm-hmm. and do that kind of. I would love to be able to, you know, travel Europe with mm-hmm. my family, whatever. Mm-hmm. And maybe now I can do that if we yeah. do this, and that's important to me. Um, Let's say you don't have the opportunity to, like, you don't have three weeks for pre-interviews. Mm-hmm. Let's say because you never do. <laughs> yeah. And let's say you're shoot you're shooting tomorrow, and you just listen to this episode. I still think there's opportunities for pre-interviews. You just have to conduct them on the floor. Yeah. You, you, you're out there walking around trying to get those people, you know, to pull them into the room so you can interview them or pull them over to the side, wherever your little booth is, whatever. Talk with them. Get to know them. It's, if nothing else is going to loosen them up a little bit, but you're going to be able to pull one or two nuggets into that kind of on-the-fly interview. Well, and, and, and to that point also, if, if this is – Going with our example, if we're at an event, you know, a user conference in Austin uh, where there's 200 people there, um, pay attention to the keynotes and pay attention to the to the presentations, because we have uh, each time for one of our clients put someone in the room with the presentations while the interviews are going on to identify someone who's got a really good yeah, especially case study openings. story, whatever. Right? Yeah. And, and it's a good way to. But yeah, to they've got a openings. case study. But if they've got a case study, if they are really entertaining, um, those kinds of things, have somebody listening to those presentations and be able to say to the interviewers, hey, let's put this person, let's try mm-hmm. to get this person in our you know, 330 slot mm-hmm. because she just gave a great presentation. Crowd loved and it. And make sure to ask about this, 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 and this. And her primary theme was that you know she hates email. So I didn't get, I didn't get to do a pre-interview with her. Right. But- because of you being in the room, we were able to then transition her into that, and we knew what we and, needed and, to talk about. And, and we literally just had like a Google Doc set up where I was making notes on the presentations. And our interview team. And the interview team would just check it between interviews to see if there was anything new, and then you know could come out and track down mm-hmm. that person who gave that presentation. Okay, so let's say we've done pre-interviews. Uh, what's next? Uh interviews yeah, well you, there's a there's a part in here about planning the story being uh, you, we kind of touched on yeah it. i mean I, I think i think that's that's the 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 bible that that you make oh yeah yeah, yeah. right knowing the, where you want to go the guiding them in the interview but I, I i think because we've already talked about that and, and i guess we we mixed it with pre-interviews yeah. but you want to yeah. know what you want to ask them you want to know how to guide them but you also you can't live by those questions and those questions alone mm-hmm. As a good interviewer, you have to actively listen to what they're saying. Mm-hmm. And it's totally possible, again, because part of the value of the pre-interview is to get the subject to verbalize what is often just abstract experience mm-hmm. for them. In the intervening time, they may think of some other things. They not they, they may not really be thinking about, oh, what, I, what should I say in my interview? Yeah. But they may recall something between the pre-interview and the actual interview that if they start to go to and and you see value in it in the moment, you want to be able to pivot and go that direction and follow yeah. that. Um, you don't want to just stick to your scripted questions, mm-hmm. and and that's part of why it's so hard to be a good interviewer is because you've got to on your feet. You've got to basically like have your hand on their back, kind of guiding them where they're going. But then if they start to turn somewhere and you see that that's a good place, you got to go with them mm-hmm. that uh, mm-hmm. that direction. And then somehow guide them in a direction that they're taking you. Yes. Yes. I mean, there, there's there's an improv aspect to it, yeah. right? It, it's you do the yes and, mm-hmm. right? Okay, let's go over here and let's find in the moment how does this connect back to right. this theme? That, yeah. And so the more you understand the subject – the more you understand what story you're trying to get them to tell you, the more prepared you are to to follow the unprepared moments. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like directing, right? Yeah. Like the better prepared you are, the easier you can handle surprises. Yeah. A lot of times if you're having trouble crafting questions or whatever, uh, the best advice I can give is write out. If, if this is going to be a, a, a two-minute video, let's say um, – or somewhere around there. Just write out what that script, what you think exactly they should say. Mm-hmm. And then work backwards. Start writing questions that might elicit that kind of story, that might elicit that kind of response. 
and and just work backwards. And then by then you'll you'll probably have five to ten questions that yeah. are going to guide most of your conversation. Before you get to the interview, one last thing: uh, it is important to prepare your subject. You know, there's just some professional courtesies like letting them know if you're going to be in a separate conference room where that is mm. let them know what time you're going to meet and let them know what to wear what not to wear but also just to make them feel comfortable about the whole process uh, there's the whole walking them to set part of our how to be a good interviewer yeah we how, have to, a, how to give true. a good interview episode that yeah that kind of covers this it's it's you know, e- even if there are things you got to in, in the pre-interview or pre-interviews, like, you know, look, I'm going to ask you the same questions I asked you before. Or, you know, even when you're sitting them down and they're getting their final makeup touches, you know, just be like, look, we're just going to have a conversation. Don't worry about the camera over here. This is just you and me talking. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be looking at you. You look at me. You may occasionally hear a question thrown from this guy behind me. You know, just, just get them... Get them to turn off all of those questions for once they sit in that chair, yeah. or up until the moment they they sit in that chair, um, and uh, you know because again I think once they walk into that conference room and they see the setup and they see this empty chair in the middle of the room with all of this gear and people around all it. that fight or flight sort of those <laughs> your, your instincts take over and yeah. it's is like this, this is risky I'm am I going to be exposed am I and I am constantly surprised by how many people's instinct is to not realize that it's going to be edited down into. Yeah. Right? Like, I've scheduled you for 45 minutes. Do you think I'm making a 45-minute video on this and we're just going to run it? Yeah. Like, have you ever watched a video before? <laughs> right? Like, yeah. but, but people just go to this, like, oh, you're going to edit it. So I can fuck up as much as I want. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Things change when they know like, that. Like, people just mm-hmm. need to hear that. For, for some reason mm-hmm. and so often volunteer that right it's like again we're just having a conversation don't worry about the camera over here you don't need to look at it if you stumble we'll go back we'll edit this you know we're going to take 40 seconds of these 45 minutes mm-hmm. and end up using that so yeah. your odds of saying something brilliant are, are pretty high <laughs> you know th- those kinds of things yeah. and I also think that that moving on to the next point that And this, to me, just goes all back to why you do the pre-interviews. The better you understand the story, the more you can understand the elements you need to tell that story. Mm -hmm. Because it's not always just that talking head on screen. Because that would be pretty boring, even with two camera angles. Yeah. The same, just showing that person talking is not that interesting. So, so what do you need? um, You know, maybe we take it out of the event context, but like if you're going to. Uh, and this happens all the time. If you're going to a client's office mm-hmm. to interview some people, mm-hmm. well, if they're talking about their jobs or whatever, you know, what B-roll of them doing their jobs or around the office or whatever yeah. might help amplify yeah. that story. For, because that's stuff you're going to want to capture while you're there after you've done the interview also. Mm-hmm. That term B-roll <clears throat> gets used a lot. I don't know how many people actually know what it means. But A-roll, it, this comes from like film roles. A role is your subject. It's the uh, the person you're filming and the the film roles or whatever the files that are associated with that person talking on camera. B role is the other camera or the other role of film somewhere else that is shooting things that aren't the A role. <laughs> Anything else. Oftentimes you'll see like second unit director. Yeah. Or something like yep. that in film credits. That's the the basically second crew. Shooting, that's shooting the location shots, the you know the establishing, the establishing shots. shots, all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff, while that source material is going on. So yeah, so knowing what your story is going to be ahead of time gives you an idea of what you might want to go shoot in the office. Maybe they t- maybe they're talking about an actual product. You might want to get a shot of them using that product, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's on their computer or in the in their hands, whatever it is. Um, but that those things just kind of add some flair and help people visualize a little bit of what, what the person's talking about. Yeah. And is absolutely true for any kind of event recap video. Just to, to break away from the documentaries, you know, the straight up like pre-prepared documentary stuff. The um, That event video stuff, especially the event recaps, if you are interviewing people, Pay attention in the moment to what they're talking about because you are going to have to get a lot of B-roll. You need to have a list. And and so if if somebody has a great, 
you know, a great quote about having never been to Austin before and not realizing that, that whatever, make a note of that and go capture footage of that so that you can, you know, put that be mm-hmm. over that clip of them saying, never been to Austin before and it's so cool that the barbecue, mm-hmm. whatever, you know, yep, whatever it is. So, so much of this just goes back to being an active listener. Um, but, I, you know, we also talk about in, in doing good interviews, we talk about having the team work together right and so it's it's if you've got a production team even if you just got one other person who's monitoring audio and and kind of tweaking the lights have them be the one who's taking the notes of Mm -hmm. that b-roll kind Mm -hmm. of stuff it just occurred to me very recently that that a lot of the stuff that we talk about in the interviews episode about kind of the nonverbal cues between uh the crew Mm -hmm. Right, so that you don't say action. Yeah. Right, so that you don't, but, you know, we, we've talked about, like, you know, you start rolling as the subject is being walked to set. You get them sitting down. Yeah. You know, the interviewer sits down and you give the tap on the shoulder. You know, what? but but so much of that is done through eye contact. It, it reminds me of being on stage in a band. Hmm. Because so often you're in the middle of a song. And you may like want to go another four bars because because I've been there, right? Your mind wanders. Mm-hmm. It's these same sixteen songs you're playing every night. Yeah, and you're in a new city and you're high on Dayquil, and <laughs> <laughs> speaking from experience, and and like you forget whether you're in the second chorus or the third chorus. But like, so you just like the way a band works together is they're just little like kind of you know yeah. nods, whatever. Like, is this and the, and then you either get the like. Right. Okay. Oh, right. No, this is where I wait, or like the the subtle nod, or mm-hmm. whatever. Right. That's kind of how that crew works. And so, if you've got somebody who's responsible for either crafting new follow up questions in the moment, or keeping track of those B roll kind of things, a lot of that stuff can kind of happen. Like, if hell, if there were three people on crew, and one of them heard something and can look over to the person who's you know who's taking those notes and, and be like that, be like, oh, what, what was just said? Let me make mm-hmm. sure I get that mm-hmm. kind of thing. I mean, the more the more ears and eyes you have listening yeah. and watching and the better your crew is at working together, you can get that stuff done without, like, interviewing or uh, interrupting. interrupting the interview Yeah. Uh, also. So that's, again, we've got a whole episode on doing the perfect interview. Yeah. Uh, so let's move on to post-production. <laughs> What do you like most about editing uh, interviews? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what I heard was, what's one thing you can pick that you like about editing? And it is, um, it's a completely different process. Instead of looking for, um, you know, the best takes of a line uh, or the best performances um, of a certain scene. You're, you're basically going back to the beginning, almost forgetting everything you know and re-listening to yeah. the interview, uh, reading it on paper. I mean, we do anytime we do interviews, we immediately send the audio off for transcription mm-hmm. so that we can do paper edits. Because for 45 it, minutes, it about, might cost you like 120 <clears throat> bucks or something. Yeah. But it's, it's so worth it. Yeah, because it's 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 easier to organize even if you've got a written transcript in front of you and you're listening at one and a half x right it, you can still go through and highlight sections yeah. oh that was really well done yeah. and then you can at least look that kind of gives you your like your like selects your takes mm-hmm. that then you can figure out these are of the 500 puzzle pieces these are the corners eight. outsides you're yeah. kind of building the frame yeah. and, the and, and, and you, you realize that you've got like these sections. Yeah. And so now it's okay. How do these sections fit together? Mm-hmm. Really, um, and and that's just a fundamentally different process. And and uh, to me, that's what a really honestly what a really good assistant editor does is they go through and and that's the way that we structure it a lot of the time is is someone who is involved in the interviews goes through and reviews the transcripts and creates a paper edit. They were in the pre interviews. They were there during the interviews. They know where this should go. Then they're looking at what was captured, putting those together and handing those then off to an editor, mm-hmm. a video editor, mm-hmm. to then go and take those pieces and optimally, with fresh eyes yeah. and fresh ears, then put those pieces together in the ways that they think the work most, mm-hmm. right? Or can make suggestions about yep. how to how to flip two things. 
that person because they have those fresh doing eyes. paper edits might even just be a writer. They might not Absolutely. be. They might not be an editor. Yeah. At all. Yeah. Of course, editing involves writing, or writing involves editing, and, and yeah. But um, but yeah. So transcripts, paper edits, selects, story building. Yeah. Craft so, your narrative. Yeah. Craft the message. That's the most important part. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> I you know I prefer to to almost we call them content edits. Almost take out the video altogether. Just listen to Use it. Use the audio, yeah. Does it tell me something? And then once it tells you what you want it to tell you, now you can go back and figure out what the visual elements mm-hmm. are. You've already got them, you know, ideally multiple angles of them telling the story. Yep. So that's your baseline. Yep. Where do I, you know, how much do I want to see that person? What kind of cuts do I need to cover? Mm-hmm. What do I need to What do I need to, to punch up with an animation or B-roll or something yep. like that? And then you can go back and, and put those, but, but you have to build it from from the words that are said to the order that the words are said to craft that coherent narrative yeah and then start building your your video elements from I know I have footage for all of the speaking now what else do I need to put yeah. in here either by necessity or uh, I mean you know one of the great things about um, that Amy Winehouse documentary right all interviews not a single talking head through the whole thing. They never showed hmm. any of the people I actually I think I've seen it. I think all I've done is read an article about how they didn't show any. Okay. Um, but as I understand it, they didn't show any talking heads, but they used a ton of interviews. But they just used the audio from them. Wow. Um, That's cool. And and so you don't have to to show the talking heads. But they are kind of there as that foundation because they are attached to the narrative that's being told. That you as a director, pre-interviewer, interviewer, and editor have have put together from someone else's authentic, honest, true words. In fact, we often say that you know the editor is the last writer, mm-hmm. and it's never more true right. than in in unscripted video. Yeah, a lot of times you're if you have a let's say you've got a four minute content cut. It's here's a story, a coherent story, but it's four minutes, and I need this to be two. Well, like you said, they're the last writer, the editor's last writer. If you've got a four-minute story that needs to be cut down to two, now you start thinking about, all right, what can I cover with visuals but not have them have to say it so that all the story elements kind of pull together. And that's why video is such a powerful powerful force because you can show and tell. Mm -hmm. Our next section is how and when to use it. Um. I think we can keep this to a, a generally brief discussion because I think we've touched on a lot of it already. Mm-hmm. If um, not in this episode, plenty of other things. Yeah. <laughs> in its simplest form, there, there's there's two opportunities. There's the top of the funnel and there's the bottom of the funnel. But the top of the funnel stuff is where you can use the you know the company culture, the the founder's story, the those kinds of things to say. You know, this like is just who it, yeah. our, yeah, this is who our authentic brand is, mm-hmm. right? This goes into the humanizing mm-hmm. element of it, right? We're not some faceless tech company that's just a bunch of code and AI. We're these people putting these pieces together to help this thing do this for you, mm-hmm. right? Because in my prior job, right? I mean, there's always, like, you get to that why, mm-hmm. right? How we got here kind of thing. And then, and, and we've already talked about this at length with, with the, the social proof and, and the law of diffusion of innovation, that bottom of the funnel, as you go further down in the funnel, you need that, that I took this risk, I implemented this, and this is how it worked for me. That, that ability to, to know that you aren't going to be, t- it, it mitigates that risk for you. Mm-hmm. And then if you want to go down even further, like we were talking about the difference between testimonials and case studies. Those case studies are probably even further down in the funnel. Yeah. Once they've already emotionally bought into this is something that I could use, now it's how can I sell this internally? Mm-hmm. Or how can I justify the investment I want to put into this because this is the return I can expect back on it or, mm-hmm. or whatever it is. But but to me, that that there's opportunities for unscripted content throughout that journey and throughout that funnel you just have to go back to who am I speaking to and what do I want them to do? Mm-hmm. Because you don't want to say, 
you, you don't want to mix the the ROI conversation with the who we are as a brand conversation. You don't want to mix the um, the social proof conversation with you know some some other you know some other more top of funnel kind kind of conversation. You do want to keep them separate. I mean, it goes back to the specific part of the manifesto, yeah. right? I mean, mm-hmm. you want to create <laughs> you want to create. Um, I know. As soon as I knew I was going for manifesto, <laughs> I heard it in my head too. Um, you want to create those specific pieces of content so that uh, so that they are serving the right purpose at the right time mm-hmm. in there. And and there are. I hope we've discussed some of the opportunities to to create a bunch of that different content and and spread it throughout that journey. Well, why don't you hit us up with a little recap of the. Uh, today sure uh, I think it's important to note that, that we define live action unscripted video as live action not scripted yep um, and then we talked about a bunch of other stuff <laughs> like when do you use it we, we, t- we talked predominantly again about the documentary style kind of content but we also did touch on early on you know event video live presentations company culture videos those are the kinds of unscripted content that isn't just that typical like customer testimonial yeah. stuff um, we talked about uh, a lot about social proof connecting to viewers giving them uh, a sense of of and, and I don't know that we talked about this directly I know we talked about it in the scripted but you know this isn't even really giving viewers a proxy for themselves in your story it, it's saying this person is you Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, this person mm-hmm. has the same mm-hmm. problems that you yep. do, and this is a real life example of their real experience with it, and, and mm-hmm. that can be very powerful. Yeah, I mean, to touch on that, I mean, the human like was it Andreessen, Mark Andreessen, software is eating the world. Software is fucking everywhere. Mm-hmm. It's some of the most profitable companies in the world. Software does not have any physical thing. Right. Like, I mean, it's just code that exists as an idea on the internet. But humanizing your brand is really important then. If, if, if all you are is a faceless product, <laughs> you need to add to that if you want to connect with people. I think that connects really well with our next episode, animation, because so much of the use case for animation is those intangible mm-hmm. products, mm-hmm. like software. Mm-hmm. You, you, it's really hard to film electrons moving from one part of a chip to another part of mm-hmm. the chip. So you've got to uh, contextualize those. And yeah. animation is a great way to do that, and that's what we're going to talk about in our next episode. We talked a lot about pre-interviewing and planning your interviews. Um, that whole section, I felt, was about, like, yes, these are easy to do, but here's how to do them right. Here's how to do them well. And we talked a little bit just a minute ago about, you know, Opportunities throughout the funnel to use unscripted content. We also had a new sponsor this week, mm-hmm. Burrito Water. Um, and if and if we want to hear their spot again, the people who brought you cucumber water, coconut water, and hot dog water are now proud to bring you Burrito Water. You know that water that drips out from the bottom of the foil wrap burrito from your favorite local taqueria. We collect all those delicious drippings, add some electrolytes, and ole, burrito water. When you're looking to hydrate but also crave something salty and a little savory, likely with a hint of cilantro, burrito water is the flavored water for you. Available in carne asada, chicken mole, and coming soon, tofu. Best served slightly above room temperature with a side of chips and queso. Agua! Lovely. Yep, so thanks to our new sponsor, Burrito Water. Um, thank you for listening. Um, actually, it's more likely we thank you for watching because we're about three to one on watches versus listens. Yeah, still figuring that out. Still figuring that out, but keep watching. I think it's probably just these Shane Uponums. Mm-hmm. I mean, how do you not watch this? Mm-hmm. Uh, give us the old like, subscribe, the downloads, all those kinds of things uh, that we do, the Spotify, the iTunes, whatever. I think I just throw the words out there and then they magically appear coherent coherent at the end that's right? what a podcast is right <laughs> yeah whatever or wherever you download your podcasts i think you got to throw that in there too that's how it's the amazing. ai knows to re-edit <laughs> that segment skip the render yep and uh and there you go that's episode 33 so uh for all of us here at the video reformation podcast thank you for joining us we will see you next time when we discuss 
a different topic. <laughs> uh, have a lovely day. I, I, I love how burrito water comes in a, like a bag. Mm -hmm. It's a really, pouch. Yeah, it's yeah. a pouch. It's not even easy to drink out of. Right. But it's, it's, it's all, just a little bit easier than trying to suck it out of the tin foil. Mm -hmm. Well, that ends up getting in all the like crevices of the tinfoil and then it like drips it. Like, right. you want all of that burrito water straight into your body. You don't want it like dripping all over your face mm -hmm. and down your neck and erotically under your chest. It is, it's a, but it's clear because you want to see the burrito water. Because it's, it's kind of. It's got um, floaters. It's got some floaters. <laughs> yep. That's the cilantro. Yeah.